In the annals of faith, the whispers of the end times have always echoed through the ages, painting the horizon with hues of hope and caution. Take a glance back and you'll find believers across eras, gazing at the skies, deciphering signs and marking calendars. Among them, radio preacher Harold Camping's voice resonated far and wide, casting a spell of urgency as he heralded the closing of an epoch in May 2011. Though the sun rose as usual the next day, the seed of reflection was sown. Now, let's voyage through the scriptures, into the heart of prophecies where the silhouettes of the times to come are sketched. The sacred text, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, unveils a dialogue about the end of the world, a finale to the present reality, dubbed as the last days or end times in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. A somber yet enlightening narrative, it unveils the tapestry of global events, attitudes, and a shift in core human values as the curtain of the present era quivers in the breeze of change. Amidst the swirl of earthly chaos, have you noticed unique kinds of individuals emerging from the corners of the globe? Their essence is different. Their hearts beat to a rhythm of change. They stand as living testaments to the unfolding script of the end times. Picture the globe as a giant canvas. Now, amidst the common strokes, these individuals paint with colors bold and divine. They carry a signature of higher truth, their actions echoing the ancient scriptures. Let's delve into a few signposts marking their journey. Firstly, the emergence of widespread conflict as foretold by Jesus. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. The imagery of Revelation chapter 6, verse 4 unveils a symbolic horseman, a harbinger of wars, draining peace from the earth's veins. Yet amid the cacophony of battles, these individuals rise, not with swords, but with love, understanding, and an unwavering faith. They embody the essence of a higher calling, their lives mirroring the celestial harmony amidst earthly discord. Their appearance isn't a call to despair, but a beacon of hope, a promise of a divine script unfolding. Every challenge they face, every act of love they bestow, echoes the profound transition, a divine choreography leading towards a grand celestial crescendo. As you traverse your path, observe the signs, recognize the faces of the divine narrative unfolding. These aren't mere coincidences, but meticulously place pieces of a grand puzzle. Each act of love, every stand for truth, mirrors the essence of the scriptures, a herald to the resonating tune of the end times. In the growing shadows of the present days, we discern a pattern unfolding, reminiscent of the days of yore described in our timeless scriptures. Across the globe, a unique breed of individuals emerges, heralding the whisper of the biblical end times. It's unfolding in the headlines, in the strife that paints our world with shades of uncertainty, the skirmishes in the ancient lands, the distant rumble of discord between nations like Russia and Ukraine, the heart-wrenching tales from Israel, they're not just mere occurrences, but a mirror reflecting the stirring of a divine narrative. Now, when the storm clouds of divine adjudication gathered in the biblical days, a profound narrative of separation played out, preserving the righteous from the tempest of divine wrath. This narrative is not just a tale of yore, but a living testament to the enduring mercy and love that cushions the hearts of the faithful, even as the storm rages around. Consider the epoch of Noah, when the earth was swathed in moral decay, a divine distinction shielded Noah and his kin from the deluge that cleansed the earth. Their ark wasn't just a vessel of wood and nails. It was a sanctuary of hope amidst a tempest of judgment. Then there's the tale of Sodom and Gomorrah, sights veiled in wickedness. Yet amidst the darkness, Lot and his family found a divine escort guiding them away from the inferno that engulfed the wicked cities. It was a manifest testament to the divine assurance that even amidst the roaring fires of judgment, the path of escape is carved for the righteous. Let's stroll through the annals of time to the shores of the Red Sea. With the mighty Pharaoh and his army in relentless pursuit, the children of Israel stood at the threshold of hope and despair. And then the divine choreography unfolded, waters parted, making a path of deliverance for the righteous. 
The instant they crossed to safety, the waters roared back, engulfing the foes in a watery grave. These aren't mere stories, but echoes of a divine promise that reverberates through time, whispering to our hearts today. As we navigate through the turbulent tides of modern times, witnessing the emergence of distinct individuals worldwide, the narrative of divine separation is not just a comforting notion, but an enduring promise to those who anchor their hopes in the divine. The biblical end times narrative isn't a tale of despair, but a clarion call to align our hearts, to discern the unfolding narrative, and to embrace the promise of divine separation. It's a journey of hope, a celebration of divine love that cradles the righteous even when the storm howls around. As we ponder on these unfolding events, let's anchor our hearts in the scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The promise is clear. The narrative is unfolding. And in the symphony of divine love, there's a place of hope and safety for the righteous. The scriptures in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 hinted at times of scarcity, a world where sustenance becomes a luxury rather than a guarantee. And here we are, witnessing a world grappling with food shortages, each day becoming a solemn reminder of the words echoed in the holy texts. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, an allegory of famine rides through the land on the back of a symbolic horseman, its journey leaving behind trails of hunger and despair on a monumental scale. The narrative isn't just ink on parchment, but is mirrored in the hollow eyes of the hungry and the cries of the famished that reverberate through the heavens. The earth, too, trembles with the burden of these unfolding times, as seismic whispers shatter the silence in one place after another. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, Luke chapter 21, verse 11. The ground beneath us isn't just a mere bystander. It, too, participates in this cosmic play narrating tales of the times through tremors and quakes. Now, let's talk about a plague not of the body, but of the soul, a disease spreading through the veins of morality. The scriptures warned us of a time when hearts would turn cold, when deceit and falsehood would be worshiped, and a guise of righteousness would veil the intentions of the wicked. Luke chapter 21, verse 11. The emergence of those whose hearts are veiled with pride, idolatry, and a distorted sense of morality is no longer a tale of the distant future, but a reality we witness daily. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 casts a warning to those who switch the moral compass, who blur the lines between right and wrong, who exchange the sweetness of truth from the bitterness of lies. These individuals, some adorned with fame and authority, parade falsehood with a sprinkle of truth, misleading many. Amidst this unfolding narrative, we are not merely spectators, but participants. It's a call to remain steadfast, to nurture the light of truth, love, and humility within us. The scriptures are not just a window to the past, but a mirror reflecting the reality of the present and a lens peering into what lies ahead. The choice is ours, whether to be swept away in the tide of deception or to anchor ourselves in the eternal truths that have navigated believers through the sands of time. The scriptures are not silent about such times. They beckon us to a higher awareness, to a greater vigilance. The words in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, resonate more than ever. As it mentions, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Today, the shadows of this prophecy stretch far and wide across the globe. The essence of righteousness is traded for a facade of benevolence, a guise that charms many. Now, let's delve a little into the annals of history, a time when idolatry was blatant. The crafting of gods from earthly materials was a norm. Fast forward to our era, and we find a subtler, yet profound form of idolatry nesting in the hearts of many. Our modern day idols may not be forged from bronze or silver, but from the desires and ideologies we hold dear. The throne that should be reserved for the divine is often occupied by our careers, relationships, or even political inclinations. We live amidst a generation where a deluded gospel, sweet to the ears yet devoid of the soul-stirring call to repentance, finds many takers. 
The essence of carrying one's cross, of crucifying the flesh, is glossed over. Lost in the loud cheers for a grace that requires nothing of us. Yet the profound truth remains that a transformative grace calls us into a journey of righteousness, a path often less trodden. As the earth groans under the weight of violence, corruption, and blatant disregard for its sanctity, the words in Revelation chapter 11 verse 18 seem to echo louder. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, in the time of the dead, that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The earth too bears the brunt of a civilization lost in the abyss of self-indulgence. Among the silhouettes of these times, a cold-hearted persona emerges, devoid of the warmth of love. The ancient verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2-3 through 3, paints a vivid picture of this persona, consumed by self-love, material pursuits, and an absence of tender affection. As wealth amasses, love diminishes, casting a frost over the heart, rendering it indifferent to the plights of others. This cold-heartedness manifests not only in the indifference to fellow beings, but stretches its icy fingers into the sacred bonds of family. As foretold in the scriptures, love that once bloomed naturally within kin now withers. Children, once the bearers of obedience and respect, drift into rebellion against the elders. Our journey through these verses unveils a stark contrast between the divine virtues of love, compassion, and the emerging cold-heartedness. It's a voyage that calls for self-reflection, urging us to seek the warmth of love amidst an encroaching coldness. An awakening beckons as we decipher these signs, urging us to foster love, kindness, and uphold the sanctity of family, defending against the icy winds of indifference. It's a call to action, a call to delve within and shatter the invisible idols, to let warmth of love dissolve the coldness enveloping hearts, reinstating the divine virtues that once held humanity together. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus laid bare a bitter truth stating, the love of the greater number will grow cold. But this coldness isn't just towards our fellow humans. It extends towards our love for the divine, replacing the holy with the ephemeral. Second Timothy chapter three, verse four articulates this further, saying in the last days, many would become lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Now, Let's traverse this journey of understanding together, shedding light on the characteristics of individuals emerging in these pivotal times. We see a shift from love and forgiveness to resentment and revenge. A grudge held is like a burning coal clutched tightly in one's hand. It's not just the offender who gets burned, but the one holding onto it. Forgiveness isn't just a divine virtue, but a release for our souls from the shackles of bitterness. Now. Let's delve into the realm of pride, a deceptive veil that binds individuals to their own shortcomings, breeding a culture of comparison and discontent. Wealth, vanity, and worldly achievements become the measuring stick of worth. Rather than the love and humility Christ exemplified, pride not only eclipses God's glory, but creates fissures in our human connections. Furthermore, the masquerade of religious hypocrisy begins to take center stage. Individuals may don a facade of worship, but their lives reflect a stark deviation from the divine standards. Worship isn't just about utterances of praise, but a life reflective of God's love and humility. The scriptures aren't just ancient texts, but a mirror reflecting the state of our hearts and the world around us. In the face of these emerging behaviors, we're not called to despair, but to light the torch of love, humility, and true worship illuminating the dark crevices of the world with hope. The Bible isn't just an old book. It's packed with prophecies that have already come true and others that have yet to happen. You might be wondering how we can be sure that the rest of the prophecies will happen as predicted. Well, we as Christians believe because the Bible tells us so. 1 Peter 1, 24 to 25 says, For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Jesus hammered this point home too in Matthew 24, 35, saying, 
Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. That's not just confirmation. It's a rock-solid guarantee that God's word holds true, and the prophecies within will all play out no matter how long it takes. Now that we're clear that every prophecy in the Bible will come true, let's talk about something intense. What the Antichrist will do in the end times. Today, I'm going to reveal some things that the Antichrist has prophesied to do, and why as believers we need to be alert so that we're not caught off guard when these events begin. So, let's get into it. The Bible tells us about a future world leader called the Antichrist, who will have immense power and demand to be worshipped. This period will be the darkest in human history, marked by extreme suffering and tribulation. People will wish they were never born. The Antichrist will be a terrifying ruler, introducing the infamous Mark of the Beast, also known as 666. Revelation 13, 16-17 tells us, It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. According to the Bible, during this time, everyone will be forced to receive this mark on their hand or forehead to participate in society. This mark will also be necessary to buy and sell anything. But here's the crucial part. Accepting the mark signifies a clear rejection of God's offer of salvation and a pledge of loyalty to the Antichrist's government. It's a serious decision with eternal consequences. The Bible doesn't give us specific details about the form or system of the mark of the beast, but it does prophesy its coming. With today's technological advancements like facial recognition, implants, and digital tattoos, it's becoming easier to imagine how the mark of the beast, or 666, could be implemented. Could these technologies play a role fulfilling the prophecy? It's a possibility, especially considering their growing acceptance in various parts of the world. But will everyone actually receive it? That's a big question. In this video, we'll explore the possibilities of how the mark of the beast might be introduced smoothly, drawing insights from scripture and observing historical events. Let's delve into it. Number 1. Oppression and Tyranny The Antichrist's rule will be marked by severe oppression and tyranny, initially targeting believers and then the Jewish population. He'll employ brutal tactics and instill fear using a powerful network of intelligence and military forces. Notably, all world leaders will support his regime, granting him extensive control to monitor every individual's activities. Refusing to worship the Antichrist or accept the mark of the beast will be seen as treason against his government and be met with harsh consequences. The Bible warns of death threats for those who resist. Surveillance will be widespread, ensuring strict control and punishment for dissenters. Those who stand against the Antichrist may face imprisonment, martyrdom, or execution. It'll be a terrifying era of global dictatorship. But here's the thing, we don't have to give in to fear. As the great Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 38-39, Nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus, not even death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, powers, heights, depths, or anything else in all creation. We must remain steadfast in truth and resist oppression and tyranny. Now let's explore another possibility of how the mark of the beast could be enforced worldwide. Number 2. Seduction and Deception The Bible warns us that the Antichrist's rule will be marked by profound deception. It won't just be about brute force. He'll be a master manipulator, weaving a web of deceit so cunning it'll even fool some good people. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10 tells us, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. The Antichrist will mimic Christ to deceive people. Picture this, 
the Antichrist performing miracles that mirror Jesus' own. He'll perform miracles reminiscent of those that Jesus performed during his time on earth. But these are cheap tricks, illusions meant to dazzle and mislead. He'll be a con artist using flashy gimmicks to gain your trust before pulling the rug out from under you. These signs and wonders will lead people astray. But why will people fall for it? The Bible says it's because they don't choose truth and love. They're vulnerable to deception because they haven't built a foundation on the genuine connection with God. Here's the key. Don't be one of those people. Seek truth, cling to faith, and remember, real miracles come from genuine love, not manipulative theatrics. Furthermore, the Antichrist will masquerade as the Messiah, using his deceitful wonders to claim he's brought the peace and prosperity the world craves. Imagine a master illusionist promising the world peace, prosperity, and even survival itself in return for accepting his mark. He would suggest that taking the mark will enhance people's lives. These lies will sway many to accept the mark of the beast as the only means of survival. Those who refuse will face persecution, being denied basic necessities like food, water, and shelter. Some will even be betrayed by their own family members in a bid to survive. Jesus warned us of this, saying that family members will betray each other. This betrayal will be fueled by the spirit of deception rampant during the Antichrist's reign. This leads us to the final possibility of how the mark of the beast will be enforced. Number 3. Global Disasters in Revelation 6, we see a glimpse of the wars, famine, and diseases that will ravage the world, pushing humanity to seek urgent solutions. Imagine the despair and the desperation. Now, picture the Antichrist stepping in, promising solutions, offering food, water, medicine, the very things people crave most. The Antichrist only offers aid to those who pledge loyalty by accepting the mark of the beast, the widespread disasters will coerce many into accepting the mark. Imagine the dilemma. Accept the mark or watch your family suffer. This is a tactic the Antichrist will use to ensure compliance, instilling fear of starvation or medical neglect. Moreover, the Antichrist may establish a global currency and economy, making it impossible to buy or sell without the mark. Many will be deceived into believing it offers protection from the harsh realities they face. But in truth, they will be enslaved. With his control over the economy, those without the mark will be unable to access money, pay bills, or obtain necessary services. Despite all these challenges, Jesus admonishes us to stand firm in our faith until the end. We must not be swayed by the Antichrist's deceptions, but remain focused on the return of the Lord. Even though the Antichrist's rule will be terrible, it won't last long. In short, the Antichrist is a false messiah aiming for world domination to destroy Israel and all followers of Jesus Christ. We must keep our focus on the Lord's return while seeking Him wholeheartedly and looking forward to that day. The Bible also admonishes us to live in a holy way, obeying God's word, loving others as Christ loved us, in avoiding any involvement with hidden activities of darkness. Just as the Bible says in Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Friends, it's important to know that the same spirit empowering the Antichrist is already at work in the world, spreading confusion and deception by leading people away from the Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. 1 John 4, 1-3 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Knowing what the Antichrist will do, we should also understand that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work, deceiving people through lust and temptation. This spirit is making a serious effort to lead many people away from the truth about God and salvation. However, 
Jesus offers us hope in life that can overcome Satan's greatest deceptions. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. As Christians, we must stand firm and not give in to the devil's tactics. We should keep our focus on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. As Hebrews 12, 1-2 tells us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily tangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. By fixing our eyes on Jesus, we can avoid being deceived because he always guides us through the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our lives. Now, let's pray a simple prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the wisdom and insight you've given us to recognize the enemy's tactics. Help us to remain steadfast in our faith, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus amidst the challenges and deceptions of this world. Guide us by your holy hand and empower us to resist the spirit of the Antichrist. May we continue to walk in truth and love, shining your light in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Prepare to embark on a gripping exploration of the unfolding signs of the end times, where biblical prophecies meet the stark realities of our present day world. In this video, we'll journey through the chilling prophetic fulfillment of scripture in the world today, specifically the revelation of a new type of people who are beginning to appear worldwide. Get ready for an eye-opening experience as we unravel the unsettling truths about these people and all they bear beneath the surface. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We'll show you how the line between good and evil is blurred especially within positions of authority and even among supposed Christians. We'll unmask the unsettling trend of labeling evil as good and the urgent need for discernment to distinguish the true gospel from deceptive alternatives. We will also show you how to identify these different categories of people and how to avoid and escape their deceptions. We'll also uncover the modern manifestations of idol worship in an age where the invisible has overtaken the visible the profane and secular have overtaken the sacred, and ambition has replaced true humility. We'll navigate the treacherous terrain of career obsessions, political fervor, and hidden vices that threaten to steal our devotion from God, and we'll see the ominous warnings about the jealousy of the Almighty. It's a spine-tingling journey into the secret idols that have taken root in our lives, subtly steering us away from our true purpose. Friends, please make sure to stay with us to the end of this video as God will use this to equip you for the age we are in. Number one on our list of the types of people appearing all over the world now are the idol worshippers in the modern age. Idol worshippers refers to the act of giving devotion, reverence, or worship to something or someone other than God, the one true and living God, our Father. Let me remind you that idol worship is considered a grave sin and a violation of the first commandment of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verse 3, which states, You shall have no other gods before me. God is the creator and the only entity deserving of worship and devotion. Any worship or adoration given to created beings or objects is a form of idolatry. In the past, Idols were mostly carved images or spirits that people offered devotion to. However, today, they are no longer confined to physical statues. Today's idols exist in diverse forms such as intangible values, desires, and pursuits that compete with God for supremacy in our lives. As the end draws near, 
we will see a lot of people who place everything else as a priority except God. These people relegate God to when other things have been said and done and are willing to do anything to satisfy their desires or the desires of others rather than God's desires. Our careers, relationships, political beliefs, social media influencers, entertainers, and even secret sins become idols in our lives that compete for the devotion meant for God. To guard against idolatry, we must be introspective and ensure that nothing takes precedence over our relationship with the Almighty. No person, thing, or passion should take God's place in our lives. We are encouraged to place God at the center of our lives and to avoid anything that competes with our relationship with Him. Number two on our list are the deceivers in the last days. 2 John 7 through 8 says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. In these turbulent times, another category of people appearing all over the world to mark the end of this world are the deceivers. Even though the Word of God calls us to repentance, there are those who sugarcoat the gospel and emphasize God's love and forgiveness without the call to turn from sin. And of course, they will have a huge following because many people love the easy and broad way that can accommodate their lavish lifestyle choices. But beloved, know this, God cannot be deceived or mocked. We will all reap whatever we sow. This means that if we sow repentance, we will reap the harvest of righteousness and God's reward. However, if we sow sin and serving the flesh over serving God, we will also reap the reward for sin, which is death. Romans 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In these last days, there will be an increase in people to try to seduce God's people and the innocent and unsuspecting. Their aim is to either displace you from your relationship with God or ensnare you in such a way that you become a slave to the spirit they represent. Beloved, we must watch out for these people. As long as the earth continues, we will encounter deceivers who cloak their untruths with a hint of truth. God's Word reminds us that discernment is crucial to navigate these times. You can see that these people are not just mere warnings. They are also prophecies, and we are seeing them happen before our eyes. Number three on the list are the proud. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Pride can subtly infiltrate our lives, leading us to take glory away from God and place it upon ourselves. Today, one of the diverse manifestations we will see more is pride, including pride in self, in achievements, and in sin. This is very important to note. You see, it's very easy for the desire for wealth, the pursuit of vanity, and an obsession with achievements to inflate our egos. Pride focuses on comparison, and we see this in many people today who believe they are superior to others due to their status or accomplishments. They refuse to be corrected, avoiding the hard truth. In doing so, they shift their focus from Christ to self, a perilous path that the enemy desires for people who walk so he can destroy them. Friends, we must continue to ask the Lord to purge our hearts and separate us from every form of pride. And God's word promises us in 1 Peter 5:6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Set aside self-righteous pride so that he may exalt you to a place of honor in his service at the appropriate time. Humility, my friend, aligns us with God's plan and purpose and will always remain an invaluable characteristic for those whom the Lord accepts. Number four, the cold hearted and unloving. When I watch or read some news lately, it sends shivers down my spine because I wonder what could come over people to do some of the things they do to others. 
There's been a strange and disturbing increase in inhumane behaviors all over the world. Today, people can just easily take someone else's life without blinking. You could be dying and people can turn their faces away or bring out their phones to take videos without lifting a finger to help you. Why? Because they feel it's none of their business or they just don't feel obligated. And the Bible already told us that such a time will come in the world in the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 3. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. We are witnessing a growing self-centeredness that fosters a lack of love for others. Bitterness and revenge have replaced forgiveness and people choose betrayal over love. As believers, we're called to shine as beacons of love and forgiveness in these dark times. Let us stay close to Christ and not allow the coldness of the world to stop us from being the light and salt of the earth in Christ. Number five are the immoral. 2 Timothy 3 verse 4 states, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Dear friends, as the end draws near, the world is experiencing a shift in values where pleasures takes precedence over God. The enemy has subtly dismantled godly values concerning life, relationships, and sexuality through entertainment, music, and media. Although the Bible emphasizes the sanctity of marriage and condemns fornication, today the devil promotes adultery and extramarital affairs, distorting the moral fabric of society. People literally talk about sexual affairs before or outside of marriage like they are discussing having lunch. Some even want to perform sexual activities in public places, thereby removing the sacredness of sex as an act of intimacy only between two people who are married. However, in the midst of all this, we saints must stand firm in the timeless principles laid out in the Bible, guarding our hearts against the normalization of sin in the world. And lastly, number six, are the category of those with a form of godliness. In today's world, we are witnessing the increase of those who have a form of godliness but lack true commitment to Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.5 warns of such individuals. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. This is deception and it permeates various aspects of our lives. From entertainment with hidden agendas to music that sounds good but carries a sinister message. Some churches and pastors may also display a facade of godliness, concealing inconsistencies in their lives. Likewise, there are individuals who may outwardly appear strong in their faith, but harbor distant hearts from God. In these times, we must guard against deceit, ensuring that our faith is genuine and rooted in a deep personal relationship with the Lord. Friends, the Word of God tells us how to navigate and avoid these people and the diverse challenges of the end times. Therefore, we must prioritize our relationships with God through prayer and His Word. Prayer is our lifeline to God, allowing us to seek His guidance, strength, and protection. Furthermore, we should immerse ourselves in His Word as David, who said he hid God's Word in his heart so that he might not sin against Him. The Word of God must remain our anchor, guiding us on the path of righteousness. As we prepare for the coming of our Lord, let us remain vigilant faithful and firmly rooted in his word as we journey through these uncertain times. Imagine if I told you that many of us aren't seeing what's already happening regarding the government of the Antichrist and the beast. It's sad that many people don't realize these things are unfolding right in front of us. But what's even sadder is that many Christians aren't aware of these things either. In this video, I want to show you what's already happening to bring about the government of the Antichrist. I'm truly glad you're watching this video right now. Please, open your heart and let God speak to you. Now, let's dive into the topic and explore it further. Daniel prophesied about this in Daniel 8, 23-25.
In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, not by human power. The prophecy has two main parts. The first is already happening, and the second is about the future. The historical part is directly about a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. He was an ancient Greek king who was very cruel and well known for persecuting the Jews while he was in power. He caused a lot of suffering for the Jewish people and made their lives extremely difficult. Antiochus even went as far as to invade the temple in Jerusalem and take all the valuable things from it. He then set up an altar for Zeus and performed a sacrilegious act by sacrificing a pig on it. When the Jews tried to resist his terrible actions, he responded with even more cruelty by killing many Jews and selling others into slavery. Antiochus even forced the Jews to worship gods that were unfamiliar to them. Even though Antiochus did terrible things, Daniel predicted that he would be defeated, but not by human strength. Just as Daniel said, Antiochus met a disastrous end. Daniel's prophecy also foretells what the Antichrist will do in the end times. Similar to Antiochus, the Antichrist will rise to power and become very influential. He'll deceive many people and force everyone in the world to worship him. The Antichrist will have a huge impact on politics, the military, religion, and the economy. His influence will be so strong that it'll seem impossible to live without him. How will this happen? The Bible already gives us a hint in Revelation 13, 16 to 18. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. One tactic the Antichrist will use is the use of force. The Bible is very clear about this. In our world today, there are already serious plans to bring about the rule of the Antichrist, known as the New World Order. These plans are carefully designed to make sure that the Antichrist government will be successful. This is to prepare people mentally, economically, and politically for the New World Order. Despite all this, many people are not aware that it's already begun. The Bible warns us that before the Antichrist fully appears, the spirit that supports the Antichrist will be active in the world. 1 John 4.3 puts it this way, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Just like when Antiochus was pushing the Jews to worship other gods instead of the one they believed in, today folks are being pushed into following a false religion instead of the real deal. This is sneaky, spreading ideas through the media, schools, and even lifestyles. A few centuries ago, people had no problem talking about their love for Jesus in public. But now, thanks to these anti-Jesus systems, it's rare to find someone brave enough to do that. Instead, people seem more comfortable bragging about their shameful actions. Shameful things that used to be kept in private are now out in the open and accepted by lots of people around the world. Lifestyles such as homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, and promiscuity were done with some level of fear. However, today, this is not the case. Through the spirit of the Antichrist, many of these people have been deceived into believing the lies of the devil. Friends, just like Antiochus made a great effort to see that the worship of God was erased in Jerusalem, this is part of the underground plan for subjection to the Antichrist's reign, disguised as liberalization. People are now advised that they can do anything they like with themselves, even if it destroys them and those they care about. When you try to show them the standard of God's infallible word, they cancel you flag you as a hater, or call you judgmental. But as long as we live, we must stand our ground and declare God's entire counsel. Dear believer, 
This is just one aspect of the underground scheme to usher the world into the government of the Antichrist, otherwise known as the New World Order. A few years before now, nobody thought of the possibility of medical surgeries like the Brazilian butt lift, complete body modifications, and other extreme cosmetic surgeries. Dear friends, all of these are subtle, conscious, and deliberate efforts to ensure the government of the Antichrist will take over soon. Now, dear saints, this is not to say as Christians we should always be withdrawn from technological, medical, or other advancements. However, we must be conscious and pay attention to some of these developments and sensitive to any quiet undertone of evil in them. Just like Antiochus was a big problem for the Jews, nowadays we can see a lot of strong resistance against the gospel and anyone who supports the message of Jesus Christ. Countries, organizations, and systems all over the world are against spreading the message of Jesus. Even the media won't focus on content that talks about salvation through Jesus. Before the Antichrist shows up, there will be even more strong oppositions to the gospel and the kingdom of God. Just like Antiochus, many nations around the world will oppose the gospel. In some countries, it's illegal to openly share your faith. There are institutions worldwide that avoid any connection with Christianity, to be politically correct, and they're often linked to things that go against the message of Jesus Christ, either directly or indirectly. There's something else happening that many are not noticing. A secret plan that could allow the new government to monitor all forms of business and the global economy. Just a few decades ago, we couldn't imagine a world without physical cash. Countries and central banks used to spend a lot of money to print cash, but things have changed a lot. Now we have shifted to a cashless reality in almost every aspect of our daily lives. People can easily make transactions without going to the bank. There are over 23,000 digital currencies all around the world. Cryptocurrencies are widely accepted and used as legal tender for buying and selling goods and services in many countries. Commerce is moving more and more towards complete digitalization, which eliminates the monitoring and control problems of the past. Nowadays, some malls and supermarkets use artificial intelligence, cameras, and supercomputers to automatically calculate the items you pick up and process your payment as you leave, without you needing to make any payment yourself. This may seem good and hopeful from a normal human perspective, but as Jesus said, we need to be as gentle as doves and as cunning as serpents. All these could be ways to test some of the tools that may be used during the One World Government. As more and more people use electronic methods to pay for things around the world today, it means that the Antichrist could have complete control over the payments that people make. Let us consider Revelation 13, 16 to 18. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The Antichrist will make everyone take the mark of the beast. The mark is 666. Those who take this mark have chosen the Antichrist and will get all the benefits of his rule. This is like what happened in the old days when some Jews followed the foreign gods that Antiochus brought to them. But those who take the mark of the beast will face eternal punishment and end up in hell. But those who refuse the mark of the beast will face hunger, pain, and death threats. People will try to trick them into taking the mark, but they will be saved if they endure. They will be saved, but they will lose their lives on this earth. Friends, remember that although Antiochus was a very cruel and harsh leader in Jewish history, he's also a sign of the future Antichrist. Daniel's prophecy wasn't only about Antiochus, but also about a future leader who will stop the sacrifices in the temple and put up an idol that will make God angry. Antiochus did something like that. But Jesus said that Daniel's prophecy would come again in the future, in Mark 13, 14. Friends, let this be a call to all believers to stay strong and watchful, so that we don't fall for the tricks and plans of the devil in these last days. Just like how God's word came true for Antiochus, the Antichrist will also be defeated, 
but not by human power. His rule will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and his angels, and he will be thrown into hell with all who take the mark of the beast. So today I urge you to stand firm in faith and be wise. Many will be deceived, but we must keep our stand as believers in Christ Jesus. In the heart of Jezreel, a moment in history was etched, a day that resonates with a chilling echo even now. This wasn't just any day. This was the day that marked the downfall of Jezebel, a name that sends shivers down the spine of those who know her story. Picture this, Jezebel, not just a queen, but a symbol of corruption and defiance against the divine, who brought the worship of Baal into the very core of Israel. Baal, a deity whose name whispered across Canaan and Phoenicia, became a beacon of misguided faith under Jezebel's influence. Let's pause and think for a moment. Why does this matter to us now? What can we in our modern world take from the ancient tale of a queen who lived thousands of years ago? The answer lies not in the dusty pages of history, but in the living message it carries. Jezebel's story is a stark reminder of how easy it is to stray from the path of righteousness, how the allure of false beliefs can lead even the mightiest to their downfall. Consider the way Baal worship seeped into Israel and Judah, morphing into various forms, catering to the desires of people, promising them prosperity and fertility. Isn't this just a reflection of our own times? The temptations that surround us? The false gods we unconsciously bow to? Be it power, wealth, or pleasure? Aren't they just modern-day Baals? But here's the crux of it all. Jezebel's end. It wasn't just a physical demise. It was symbolic of a greater truth, a truth that screams out to us even today, that the path of defiance against God, the path of immortality and idolatry, leads to destruction. Remember the words in Revelation 2.20 where a false prophetess is compared to Jezebel for leading people astray. This isn't just a story. It's a wake-up call. Jezebel's life, her choices, and her tragic end serve as a vivid, almost visceral warning. It's a call to introspect, to look within ourselves and ask, are we letting the Jezebels of our world mislead us? Are we too, in some way, succumbing to the lures of modern day idols? It's urgent that we realize this, for in this realization lies our salvation. Friends, the tale of Jezebel isn't just an ancient narrative. It's a mirror held up to our society to our lives. It's a reminder that though times may change, the fundamental truths of righteousness, of walking in the path God has set for us, remains unaltered. Let's take this story not just as a historical account, but as a personal call to re-examine our faith, our choices, and our allegiance. A king, Ahab, yearns for a simple vineyard, a piece of land that shimmers in his dreams like a jewel. But it's not just any land. It belongs to Naboth, a man whose roots in that soil run as deep as his ancestors' memories. Now, enter Queen Jezebel, a name that's become synonymous with treachery and malevolence through the ages. Imagine her not just as a queen, but as a tempest, a storm of ambition and cunning. She sees her husband, the king, sulking, his royal brow clouded with discontent. He tells her of the vineyard he cannot have. And in that moment, Jezebel's resolve hardens like iron. She whispers to Ahab words dripping with assurance. Leave it to me. Your heart's desire shall be yours. And so a plan, dark as the moonless night, unfolds. Jezebel, with the stroke of a pen and the seal of a king, writes a death sentence for Naboth, masking it as justice. The vineyard is seized. Naboth's life is snuffed out. And in this act, Jezebel sows the seeds of her own destruction. For in the shadows, a judgment as inevitable as the tide waits. Jehu, a general, a force of divine retribution, is on the horizon. He's not just a man. He's the embodiment of a righteous storm sent to uproot the wickedness that has taken hold. The Bible tells us in Revelation 17, 5-6 of another figure, a symbol of corruption and defiance against the divine, this figure, drunk on the power and blood of the saints, mirrors Jezebel's own journey. 
Jezebel, intoxicated with power, blinded by her own ambition, failed to see the writing on the wall. Friends, this story isn't just a tale from the past. It's a mirror reflecting our own times. How often have we seen power corrupt, ambition blind, and justice perverted? How often have we witnessed the innocent suffer while the corrupt bask in temporary triumph? But remember, this story doesn't end with Jezebel's triumph. It ends with her downfall, a fate so dramatic, so absolute, that it serves as a warning through the ages. The day Jezebel fell was a day of reckoning, a stark reminder that justice, though sometimes slow, never forgets. As you walk through your own life witnessing the world's Jezebels rise and fall, remember this. The vineyards of your heart, your integrity, your compassion, are worth more than the passing desires of power and greed. Stand firm like Naboth and know that the truth, like a steadfast rock, endures beyond the fleeting storms of ambition. In the heart of a bustling ancient city, Jezebel crafts a scheme so sinister it chills the bone. She uses the disguise of a religious ceremony, a day of fasting, not for piety, but as a cloak for her dark intentions. This isn't just about bending rules. It's about breaking the very essence of justice and morality. Now imagine Naboth, an ordinary man proud of his vineyard, unaware of the storm brewing. Jezebel's plan is set in motion. She forges letters, sets the stage, and plants two liars to accuse Naboth of blasphemy. The injustice is startling, an innocent man condemned under a facade of legality. It's a scene that makes you question, how often do we witness untruths wrapped in the garb of truth? The plot unfolds and Naboth is stoned to death, his blood soaking the soil of his own vineyard. The news reaches Jezebel and with chilling calmness, she tells her husband Ahab to take possession of the vineyard. It's a moment that captures the extent of human greed and manipulation. But friends, this isn't just about human wickedness. It's also about divine justice. Enter Elijah, a prophet of God, a beacon of truth in a sea of deceit. He confronts Ahab right in the stolen vineyard with words that echo through time. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. The prophecy unfolds. Ahab falls in battle. The narrative then shifts to Jehu, anointed by Elisha, Elijah's successor. Jehu's mission is clear, to bring down Jezebel's house. He eliminates her son, Joram, fulfilling part of the divine prophecy. And then comes the day Jezebel meets her end. She doesn't cower or hide. She faces her fate head on, defiant to the last. Positioned at a window, she challenges Jehu, mocking the very notion of fear. But her bravado is in vain. In a twist of divine irony, she falls, and dogs consume her body, just as Elijah had prophesied. This story, friends, is more than just a historical account. It's a powerful metaphor. It speaks to us today, urging us to examine our own lives. Where do we see injustice, manipulation, or greed? Are we like Jezebel, using our power and influence for selfish gains? Or are we champions of truth and justice? The demise of Jezebel isn't just a tale of retribution. It's a call to introspection. It reminds us that the seeds of deceit and cruelty we sow will inevitably lead to destruction. It's a stark warning that the pursuit of selfish ambitions at the expense of others leads to a fall. And to recap the story again, there was a man, a prophet, who received a divine command. His task? To anoint a new king, a man named Jehu. Picture this prophet, young and determined, with his heart pounding with the weight of his mission. He finds Jehu, pulls him aside, and with a simple flask of oil, anoints him as king. But this isn't just a ceremony. It's a divine decree of change, a shift in power ordained by God himself. Now, Jehu was tasked with a monumental mission to confront the wickedness of Queen Jezebel and her husband, King Ahab. Jezebel wasn't just any queen. She was infamous for her evil deeds, a name that even today symbolizes deceit and treachery. Her actions had consequences, not just for her, but for her entire kingdom. 
You see, Jezebel had led many astray, promoting idol worship and persecuting the prophets of God. Her influence was like a dark cloud over Israel, but God's justice was about to unfold. Fast forward to the Day of Reckoning. Jehu, now king, confronts this queen of deception. There's Jezebel in her palace, perhaps thinking she could charm or intimidate Jehu, as she'd done with so many before. But Jehu wasn't swayed. He knew his duty. In a moment of intense drama, Jehu orders her to be thrown from the window. It's graphic, it's violent, but remember this. This isn't just about Jezebel's fall. It's about the fall of evil itself. The Bible doesn't shy away from the harsh realities of life, and neither should we. Jezebel's end was prophesied, and it was fulfilled. Dogs consumed her body, a stark and gruesome image, but one that speaks volumes. It's a reminder that evil, no matter how powerful it seems, will have its downfall. But let's not miss the real message here. It's easy to focus on the dramatic end of Jezebel and miss the real message for us. This story isn't just about the past, it's about our present and our future. Every day we face choices. Do we follow the path of righteousness or do we succumb to the temptations of this world, to the Jezebels that surround us? The story of Jezebel teaches us that our choices have consequences. It's a solemn reminder to stay true to what's good and right. So, as we reflect on this tale, let's ask ourselves, what are the Jezebels in our lives? What are the influences we need to confront and overthrow to stay true to our path? Remember, with God's guidance, no challenge is insurmountable. In closing, let this story be a beacon of hope and a warning, a hope that righteousness will ultimately triumph, and a warning that evil, no matter how powerful, will meet its end. Let's carry this message in our hearts and live our lives with the courage and conviction of Jehu, guided by the unwavering light of God's truth. While Ahab and Jezebel enjoyed earthly power, their story is a stark reminder that such power is fleeting and hollow when set against eternal truths. They had everything by worldly standards, wealth, authority, influence, yet they were spiritually bankrupt. This begs us to reflect what are we chasing in our lives? Are we seeking fleeting pleasures and power? Or are we building a legacy of righteousness and love? It's clear that Jezebel's influence was profound. She wasn't just a passive partner in Ahab's reign. She was a driving force behind many of his worst decisions. This brings to light the power of influence in our lives. Who are we allowing to shape our decisions and our paths? Are they leading us towards light and truth? or down a path of darkness and deceit. The end of Jezebel is marked by one of the most chilling and graphic demises in the Bible. This harsh ending serves as a divine judgment, not just on her acts, but on the very spirit of rebellion and idolatry she embodied. It's a sobering reminder that while God is merciful and patient, His justice is inevitable. In this story, we find critical life lessons the company we keep can elevate us or bring us down. Our actions, especially those in power, have far-reaching consequences. And most importantly, turning away from God leads to a path of destruction, not just in this life, but eternally. Now, friends, as we ponder these truths, I urge you to reflect on your life. Who are the Jezebels influencing you? Are you standing firm in your faith? Or are you being swayed by the idols of our time, be it power, wealth, or pleasure? Let's engage in this conversation. Share in the comments below how this story resonates with you. What are the vineyards you're coveting? Who are the influences in your life steering you away from God's path? And don't forget, if this message has touched your heart, like and subscribe to our channel for more insights and guidance on your spiritual journey. Let's walk this path together, seeking truth and light in a world that often seems filled with Ahabs and Jezebels.